everyone. We're going to get started. I want to thank you for joining us today for the third and final talk in our summer lecture series on Madison and the evolution of fashion. Um, we are thrilled once again today to have Tori with us. Tori, if you've been following along, as you know, is a Guilford native, a recent graduate of Rutgers University, and will soon, in a couple of weeks, be starting her graduate degree at NYU. Um, we wish Tori the greatest of success, and we are just so honored and so thrilled that she's been with us um, these, these almost a year now. So, and she's just unearthed so many treasures and helped us to really appreciate anew our uh, textile collection. So without further ado, Tori, I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our last lecture from our three-part series. Um, before we get started, I'm going to send you all very quickly in the chat, um, just a link to some terminology and vocabulary that I might be using during my lecture. Um, if any of you want to follow along with that, feel free. Um, if not, and you want to go take a look at it after the lecture is over, that's fine as well. Um, but it is in the chat for you guys to access before we get started. All right. So um, as hopefully most of you guys know from attending our last lecture, we kind of ended up um, around 1900 at the tail end of the Victorian era. And we're going to be today taking a look at some of the collections from here at the Historical Society, um, encompassing kind of the early 20th century. Um, so to begin, we will be starting in kind of the Edwardian era, which is directly following the Victorian era. Um, so the Victorian era ended uh, following the death of Queen Victoria in 1901, and thus began the Edwardian era, which continued on until around 1910. Um, so the traditional Edwardian silhouette is somewhat similar to the kind of late Victorian silhouette that we were looking at last week. There are character characteristics that kind of trace over into the turn of the century. However, there are also characteristics that are very uniquely Edwardian. So. To kind of look into that, we're going to take a look at one of the garments in our collection here at the museum, um, specifically an Edwardian style of gown. Um, this dress in particular is a morning gown. So last week we talked a little bit about morning wear. Um, I'm just going to reiterate that a bit. Uh, so during the end of Queen Victoria's reign, following the death of her husband, Prince Albert, she spent the last 40 years of her life in morning wear. So she was wearing all black. And because of that, there was a drastic increase in popularity of morning wear and wearing morning wear and kind of participating in um, that culture of dress of, due to the influence of Queen Victoria. So because of that, we started seeing a massive spike in morning wear and wearing morning wear during the later half of the 19th century. Um, so. <laughs> That being said, during the Edwardian era, this took a kind of steep decline because obviously Queen Victoria had died and she was no longer being seen publicly, you know, wearing all black pretty often. So that being said, we do have a piece in our collection that is morning wear and that is this gown right here. So this gown is actually a really, really wonderful example of the typical style of dress of the Edwardian era. This dress was probably created and worn around 1905, so it kind of hits right in the middle of that period between 1900 and 1910. That being said, it is a bit unique because it is all black. So there's something important that you guys should note about kind of the style of dress that was popular during this time period. It followed this um, style of kind of architecture and decor um, known as Art Nouveau, which basically encompassed a lot of natural kind of um, swirly motifs and embellishments. Um, and it was very kind of drapey, elongated, and um, contrasts to what we'll see later in the next 20 years, this kind of art deco, flashy, um, stylistic design that we see during the kind of 1920s flapper era. So we have a very Art Nouveau style of dress that's happening during kind of this era. If you guys look at this gown, um, in particular. Some of the notable features are the sleeves here, which are Guizhou sleeves. So if you remember back to last week um, and to our lecture on the Victorian era, I talked a little bit about Guizhou sleeves and they remained popular kind of throughout the entirety of the 19th century. That being said, the Guizhou sleeves that we were seeing last week, if you guys remember, 
were primarily um, very big, very structured. Uh, they were the two velvet bodices that I took out had hijo sleeves on them and they were very structured, very much they stood out from the body and then they gathered down into the lower arm and came down um, into a sleeve. This style of hijo sleeve that we see here on our Edwardian gown is much less structured. It's much more flowy, drapey, it kind of comes down into this droplet silhouette and then it still gathers down into this lower arm area. Another really notable characteristic of the Edwardian silhouette actually has a lot to do with the undergarments and the understructures to um, this look. And essentially, um, when we begin kind of talking about what the undergarments look underneath this, it's important to take into account some of the very influential people at this time period. Um, so if you guys look at the silhouette, it's still somewhat similar to the silhouette of the later Victorian era. We're still seeing the bustle being worn. So if I lift up this arm, you can see that there's fullness in the back of the skirt. And there's kind of this peacock look coming out of the chest where we're having a puff that gathers down into a waistband. This silhouette though, however, is referred to for the most part, if you guys can see, as an S-curve silhouette. And that is achieved thanks to the undergarments that are worn under the dress. So I have here oops, an example of actually an advertisement uh, from the Edwardian era showing the difference between someone wearing the correct undergarments and then someone just wearing their clothing as is. So as you can see, there's the bustle in the back and then there's the puff in the front. So the bustle is um, the Bustle is achieved through wearing a bustle or a structured undergarment, which we looked at last week. However, this kind of puff out in the front is achieved thanks to the style of corset that became popular around this time period. Um, as I said previously, it is referred to as an S-bend. And as you guys can see here, that is kind of what it looks like. So the really interesting thing about these corsets is something that we talked about a little bit last week, um, being the fact that Historically, people didn't wear corsets with the intention of kind of cinching their waist in really tightly and like crushing their ribs and kind of like there's this misconceived notion that, you know, everyone was just trying to contort their body into something that it wasn't. And historically, that was the case. People weren't trying to do that. Um, they were mostly wearing corsets in the same kind of vein as we wear a bra today with the intention of just kind of helping to structure and hold up the body. And if your corset was really tight, then that meant it didn't fit. Um, that being said, around this time period, we saw the popularization of um, someone known as Charles Dana Gibson, you guys might have heard before. He was a very popular illustrator and he kind of coined this idea of the Gibson girl. So I can show you guys a couple examples of his work. He is an illustrator um, and he would draw these kind of idealized women from the time period, right around the turn of the century. The models he would use, such as this one here, would very much be um, perpetrators of this kind of S-bend silhouette. They were trying to achieve this look. And the way that they would do so was through a process called tight lacing, where essentially what they would do is they would lace their corsets as tight as they could in the waistband to kind of make their waist as small as they possibly could and then fill out using some kind of batting um, out in the front of their bodices. If we actually look in the front of this one, it has some kind of filling. And then they would wear the um, bustle in the back. So this was kind of one of the first time periods when we were seeing a really major example of people purposefully contouring and kind of contorting their body in order to achieve a desirable silhouette in a way that we had never really seen like to such an extent before. Nowadays, you can kind of liken these silhouettes and kind of trying to follow the trends of shaping your body to that of like a pinup girl or a Kardashian, where you're trying to kind of match the silhouette of a celebrity. And the Gibson girls were kind of the first example of that. And it can be seen here in this dress that we just took a look at. So that's kind of the style of the Edwardian era. As we moved into kind of 1910, and the pre-war years, so before 1914, um, the style starts to shift a little bit. 
And a big part of that can be attributed to a French designer known as Paul Poiré. Um, so before I get into Poiré, I just want to kind of track back a little bit and mention the fact that, as I said, this is kind of the pre-war style. Following the start of World War I in 1914, there was a kind of shift in what people were wearing and how they were wearing it. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about like uniforms and such because there are people who are complete experts on that field. And while we do have some cool uniforms here, we're going to mostly focus on kind of daywear fashion. Um, that being said, uh, I will talk a little bit about some of the influences that military uniforms had on kind of everyday fashion. So tracking back to the beginning half of the 1910s. So we have this beautiful dress here. This dress, if you look at it kind of from a side view, if I shift it a little bit, has a somewhat similar shape in the top of the bodice to the one of um, the one from 1905. That is because we don't see a huge change in kind of the silhouette of wanting to have this puff out in the front. However, we do see a major change in the fact that the skirts no longer have the bustle in the back. And as I previously mentioned, <laughs> A lot of that is due to the influence of a French designer named Paul Poiré, who in 1911 um, made two kind of major fashion innovations that he brought to the general public and then became very mainstream, very popular. They were harem pants um, and the hobble skirts. So he was someone who was very influenced. He was very heavily influenced by Orientalism and kind of Asian and Middle Eastern cultures. Um, and as a result, he started trying to bring that style of dress into his kind of Western fashion design work. And we see this mainly through his kind of inv invention of the hobble skirt. The hobble skirt essentially, and I have an image I can show you all, was a skirt with a very, very narrow hemline at the bottom. So the idea was that when a woman wore it, she would hobble because she couldn't fully move her legs. And so that's kind of where its name came from. And while that wasn't really practical and we didn't see the hobble skirt really make a full kind of come into fashion, it did drastically influence the silhouette of women's fashion um, in regards to the fact that people were no longer wearing bustles. They wanted skirts that were very fitted, almost like a pencil skirt nowadays, very fitted around the hips and down the legs. So we can see this here in this example from our collection. The skirt is very fitted. And while this is obviously not a hobble skirt, it does have fullness in the bottom. It is fitted almost entirely to the body down to probably the knees, um, which can kind of be attributed to Paul Poiré and his hobble skirt. The other um, garment that I mentioned that Paul Poiré was very influential in his design of was the um, harem pants. So harem pants, were never like incredibly popular. However, they were um, very influential in kind of taking a step forward in this movement to have women wearing pants, <laughs> something that kind of before the turn of the century didn't really happen. We had a few examples here and there of women wearing bloomers, um, which were actually named after a woman named Amelia Bloomer, who notoriously wore pants. Um, <laughs> however, uh, aside from that, we didn't really see women wearing pants in kind of like a mainstream way. It was very kind of seen as ostracized and alternative and not, you know, common. Paul Poiré was a very influential designer. So he started putting very influential people in these harem pants, meaning that it slowly became more normal and more accepted. And he was kind of a contributor, contributor to that. So it is an important part of kind of his design history to mention. So, Continuing on, um, as I said, this is kind of more of a day dress, but it's got the silhouette of kind of the early um, 1910s. So going into World War I, there are a couple things that I wanted to bring up regarding fashion during this time period. And one of them is actually back here. Um, we can bring the camera over. And this is a really interesting garment. Um, because I think it's one that a lot of us can relate to. I know I can relate to it, and I'm assuming there's a couple people in the audience who can relate to this one as well. So this is a shirtwaist, and shirtwaists became very, very popular at the turn of the century. Um, and they remained popular throughout kind of uh, the First World War. 
essentially what a shirt waist is, is it's a women's blouse, but it's designed in the style of a men's shirt. And they started being worn by kind of more everyday people. If we look over at the black gown that we were talking about earlier, that is very much worn by someone who is upper class enough that they can kind of wear a morning dress. They probably don't have a ton of other, you know, obligations. They're not working in a factory. They're not working somewhere high risk. Um, however, the shirtwaist was something that was very accessible to um, just kind of the everyday person, particularly immigrants and people coming into New York City. So I know, like my family, can trace its roots back to. Ellis Island and um, our great grandparents, you know, coming over to New York and living as immigrants and working in the city in kind of an industrial setting um, that wasn't seen as much prior to kind of the end of the 19th century. So basically, my ancestors would more likely be wearing something along the lines of this than something along the lines of this. I don't know how many people can relate to that, but I can. So um, a shirtwaist, as I said, is basically just a woman's blouse designed in the style of a men's shirt, and it would have been worn with a skirt. That being said, if you do look into archival photos, especially in New York City, and especially in kind of more industrial parts of um, the city in particular, you do sometimes see women wearing pants. And then we get into World War I, people start wearing pants um, more then as well as there's more women in the workforce. So um, this is kind of a turning point for women's fashion, and it is a much more kind of practical everyday piece of clothing, something that in the past few lectures we haven't gotten to see as much of because people don't tend to keep everyday clothing as they do with kind of their nicer garments. So I think that was kind of interesting, and I think it's a fun thing to know. Um, another, oops, another important garment from this time period um, that has to do with the undergarments and actually has to do with pants and kind of ties in with Paul Poiré a little bit is um, drawers. So prior to the turn of the century, most women under their dresses would wear petticoats and it would just be petticoats. They wouldn't wear anything else. However, um, around the turn of the century, we started seeing women wearing drawers. And drawers are essentially just big pants that they would wear under their garments. Um, this one's very pretty. It's got some lace at the bottom, this ribbon. Um, and this one has a gusset in the crotch area and it buttons on the sides. And so it would have been worn underneath um, the petticoats and underneath the gown. There's two styles of drawers that we see women wearing during the early 20th century. And it's those uh, closed bottom, closed crotch ones that usually button on the side. And then we have the open crotch ones, which basically are kind of like two pants and they button in the front and then the crotch is open. So those are the kind of two styles of drawers, two styles of undergarments that would have been worn during this time period. All right, so, oh, two more things I wanted to note about kind of the World War I era and its influence on everyday fashion. Uh, the first important one is that World War I helped popularize the zipper. The zipper um, was actually first invented in 1893, and it was shown at uh, the World Fair, but it wasn't actually available in kind of a mainstream sense until the later 1910s. And a lot of that had to do with kind of the First World War, and they started incorporating it into clothing and into fashion in a way that had never been seen before. In addition to the zipper, we first started seeing um, the uh, use of Velcro. And Velcro was actually invented um, by someone who was walking through a field and got a bunch of burrs stuck to them. Um, and when they pulled the burrs off, they saw that there were little hooks on the end of the, um, on the end of the little seeds. And they realized like, oh, this could be an interesting way to like keep clothing together, keep pieces of fabric together. And thus Velcro was invented. So those are kind of two war era, um, inventions that really influence fashion moving forward. I'm sure all of us still have plenty of things that involve you know, zippers and Velcro. So that is kind of the 1910s. Our next era that we're going to be looking at is the 1920s. And our collection here at the Madison Historical Society has some really, really wonderful pieces from kind of the 1920s flapper era. So to give some context to these garments before I start pulling them out and we can look at them together. 
Um, in the 1920s, there was this kind of drastic shift away from the silhouette of the Edwardian era and the early kind of turn of the century fashions. So when we look at the silhouette of the Edwardian era, two of the kind of notable things about that silhouette are the chest puffing out and the butt kind of thrusting out thanks to the bustle that's worn underneath. It's very kind of got, it's, it's got a very strong emphasis on the curvature of the body and kind of the curves of the silhouette. During the 1920s, during the post-war era, there was this very drastic push pushback against that style and that silhouette. And it led to the kind of innovation of a term, a fashion term known as la garçon, which if you know French translates to boyish or the boyish look um, that was really popularized by designers, including Coco Chanel um, and Elsa Schiaparelli. And the boyish look essentially was trying to convey a silhouette that was you know, the exact opposite of kind of the Edwardian era. It was a very thin look. There was basically no bust. There was basically no hips. And the dresses that were being made for that style and for that time period were very boxy, very rectangular. And you couldn't really pull them off unless you didn't really have curves. You had to be kind of very thin and very, um, very flat um, in kind of all senses of the way. So um, this style remained popular through the 1920s. And in kind of a more um, evening wear sense of the way, we started seeing the flapper style. So um, I can pull out a couple of our flapper dresses. So we have one on the dress form over here, and then I'll grab these two. So I think I got it. So the intention of this style of dress was to create kind of an androgynous silhouette. Um, so it wanted to create a body that was free from curves. So I bring them up here. As you guys can see, the waistlines drop significantly from the natural waist. So we've got these two dresses, we've got this one over here. And some of the notable embellishments that we see across all of these dresses include um, this very Art Deco silhouette. We can see that on this gown here, the Art Deco embellishments in kind of the waistband and in the shoulders. Um, and then um, the use of a uh, handkerchief um, embellishments. So this right here is kind of a big version of a handkerchief um, embellishment. We also see handkerchief hems. This one here has a handkerchief hem, which essentially just means that if you know when you hold a handkerchief, kind of the uh, corners end up drooping down. That's what they're trying to achieve with that hem. And here we kind of have an embellished handkerchief hem, where instead of it being the full um, hem of the dress being the handkerchief style, it's just got a couple little pieces placed into this lace fabric. One of the important things to know about flapper kind of fashion, flapper style, and the la garçon style of dress um, that I think a lot of people are unaware of actually is a misconception that was actually kind of, is still being very heavily pushed by like the Halloween costume industry. And that is the use of fringe. Um, I think it blows people's minds a little bit. People didn't actually wear fringe during the 1920s. I can't think of a single example of an extant garment in a museum or collection that actually has fringe on it. Um, it's pretty much not worn uh, historically. However, it is very much pushed nowadays as kind of something that was worn during the 20s. We do see examples of people wearing string beads. Uh, sometimes that'll be an embellishment on gowns. However, uh, fringe in the sense of the way we think of fringe nowadays, where it's the little strings kind of all hanging off, wouldn't have historically actually been worn. <laughs> so there's kind of your fun fact about the 20s for today. Um, yeah, so here's the two other dresses. Let me bring them up close so you guys can see. Which, as I said, oops, at the back. We've got the low waistline, we've got the handkerchief hem at the bottom. This one as well. We've got the low waistline at the bottom. And this one has the handkerchief hanging off the shoulder. It was very common um, to have kind of these asymmetrical silhouettes and embellishments during this time period. Um, and we can see that on a couple of the gowns. I have one more flapper dress that I want to bring over. 
And this one is actually a great example of kind of the Art Deco embellishment style that I was speaking about earlier. Should be a little careful, this one's very fragile. But here we have that kind of very Art Deco embellishment down the front. And if we look in the back, as I said before, we've got that asymmetrical kind of swag coming, oh, other way, swag coming down um, into a piece of embellishments down here. Uh, on the hemline, this one also, does it have a handkerchief? Yes. Oh, no. It doesn't have a handkerchief hem. Um, I can't tell. <laughs> oh, it, oh, it's got this hanging piece that was throwing me off. Um, it does have embellishments at the hemline, though. Um, and yeah, it's a beautiful gown. It does have a little bit of wear and tear over here. However, it is in pretty good shape. Yeah. If we're going to talk a little bit about those dresses, I just want to briefly mention what would have been worn under them. The kind of popular style of undergarment from this time period, actually before I grab that, um, the first bra was actually invented around 1920. Um, and it was invented by a woman, um, her name was Carice Cosby, and it, she actually invented it and patented it um, following a night where she was going out to dinner and she had a gown on and she didn't like that you could see the top of the corset through the gown. So she ended up taking two handkerchiefs and sewing them together and putting like a piece of ribbon around it. And she patented that as the first bra. So this was a time period when people were very kind of against the corset. People started drastically moving away from it. They didn't want to wear it anymore. And that was kind of the first example of that happening. Another type of undergarment that would have been worn, however, is this here, which is called a step in. And they were very unique almost primarily to the 1920s. And essentially what it is, is kind of a chemise and pair of drawers combo. So we've got this top part and we've got the pants on the bottom and it's referred to as a step in because you have to step in through the top. Um, and this one is this one, this one is open crotch as well. So that was pretty popular during this time period. All right. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about undergarments, a little bit about the fashion of the 1920s. And then we're very briefly just going to talk about the 1930s. We don't have a ton of dresses in our collection from the 1930s. That being said, I pulled one great example that we'll take a look at. Um, but a couple things to note, following the stock market crash in 1929, um, we saw a major shift towards modesty um, and away from kind of that extravagant party look of the roaring 20s where everything was short, everything was very revealing, very little like straps, very little covering. Um, and the hemlines dropped pretty drastically once again. Things were primarily floor length or if not kind of down to the thigh. We didn't see things that were hitting at the same length as these flapper dresses that we just took a look at. Another important thing to note about the 1930s is the fact that there was an major increase in kind of influential women. And that was thanks to the film industry. We started seeing women in film and film stars appear for the first time. And so those women managed to popularize, popularize the style of dress that unfortunately we don't have a great example of, but I do have one here. And I wish we had a dress form that it fit on because then it would kind of do it better justice. Here we go. I kind of see, I hope the lighting's good. Um, this is a bias cuff slip dress. And this style of dress was majorly popularized thanks to the film and television industry. So before the invention of stretch fabric, which is everything we're talking about is before the invention of stretch fabric, um, people wanted to find a way to make a very kind of body contouring gown without, you know, um, having to, you know, do like pleating and fitting and, um, having a garment that was super constrictive. And the way they achieved that was through using bias cut fabric. And bias cut fabric essentially means any kind of fabric that's cut um, diagonally instead of on the straight of grain. So when you cut fabric like that, it's much kind of slippier, it's much stretch stretchier. And while it's more difficult to sew with, it clings to the body in a different way than straight cut fabric does. When you actually <laughs> finish um, sewing a bias cut garment, you have to hang it up and let it sit for a couple days because it'll stretch out. Um, and then you have to readjust the hemline because it will stretch out, it'll be all wonky. 
But um, this style of dress was very popular because it was kind of fitted to the body. It was very revealing and very good for kind of the teams marketing um, women in film. <laughs> so in addition to the bias cut dress gaining popularity thanks to the film industry, we also had makeup gain popularity. And unfortunately, we don't have any example of kind of makeup that people would have worn, but I did want to bring it up because it was really a major shift in kind of the female beauty standards and silhouette and look of the 1930s. Before the 1930s, women really didn't wear makeup that much. They wore it a bit in the 20s, but it was kind of considered taboo. It was kind of considered um, strange. And if people did wear it, they wouldn't wear anything kind of out there and elaborate. Um, however, thanks to these film stars and the popularity of um, film and television, um, <laughs> the popularity of film, um, not yet television, um, we started seeing all of these women, these beautiful women who would have full faces of makeup, thus kind of bringing makeup into kind of a mainstream kind of sense, a mainstream audience, and kind of making it more accessible to everyday people. So, I believe that is most of our lecture. Oh, there was one thing. I totally skipped over this. Um, let me, this is my last thing. We have to track back a little bit. This is actually from closer to the Edwardian era. And this is a duster. And this coat, I just wanted to bring out because it's nothing super beautiful. It's nothing super beautiful. It's nothing crazy unique. However, I think it is really interesting to talk about in reference to Madison um, and in reference to kind of living in Connecticut because duster coats were invented thanks to the popularization of automobiles. So I don't know if you guys know this, um, I'm sure most of you have driven on like Merritt Parkway before. Merritt Parkway was actually um, invented uh, because they wanted to make kind of coastal Connecticut more accessible to people in New York City. And kind of one notable fun fact about Merritt Parkway is the fact that you can't drive a truck on it. And that was done intentionally because the people making the Merritt Parkway did not want busloads of immigrants coming out to coastal Connecticut. They just wanted people who could afford cars coming out to coastal Connecticut. So people who could afford cars would also purchase a duster. And a duster would go over their gowns and be worn uh, so that their gown or their dress, such as this one here, didn't get dirty while they were driving down the Merritt Parkway to get to you know, Madison or any coastal Connecticut town from the city. So I think that was actually a good kind of place to finalize our lecture today, but I want to open up to questions if anyone has them. So feel free to unmute and ask away. Can, can, you, get, can you get the camera a little closer to the dresses? Can you guys see all right? Yeah. All right. So here's a bit of a close up on our Edwardian gown. Um, as you guys can see, it's got some beautiful embellishments, beautiful lace at the top. It's got the Guizhou sleeves down the side. I'll show you the back. Got the bustle. We've got some large ribbons running down to cover the kind of um, skirt seam in the back. And here is our 1911 gown. As you can see, it's much more fitted around the waist. Got some very nice little buttons on the sleeves. Buttons down at the hemline. And we've got one of our flapper dresses with the handkerchief hemline, shirt waist, and if I just walk over here, we can take a quick look at the duster. This one's around turn of the century, probably 1901, 1902, and our two other flapper dresses. Some lines, some embellishments. And our last dress over here.
All right. So thank you everyone for, for joining us. I'm sorry we had a few technical difficulties there. Um, again, just want to thank Tori so very much for all of her hard work and everything she's done since she's been with us here in September. Uh, this last lecture will be posted on the website within the week. Um, and the one quick thing that I wanted to mention is that I think what became apparent in this talk is that we don't have much in our collection kind of post-1930. So we are always actively looking for, for more artifacts, including clothing, objects from, from the 20th century. So we have a pretty strong collection in World War I era. Um, we have lots of uniforms. Those of you that came to our um, exhibit would, will know that. But you know, kind of moving on into the 20th century, we don't have as much. So if you know of anyone that is clearing things out and has stuff that they want to donate to us specifically, if it has the Madison provenance, we would love it. Um, and it would help to really flush out our, our collection. So again, thank you so much to Tori for all of your hard work and everything you've done. We are just so thrilled that you have shown us all these different things and that we now have this recorded and it will always be part of our, our website and, and will just help us to be aware of the depth of our collection. So I'm so thrilled. Thank you so much and wish you all the best in everything you do in the future. So thank you everyone. Thanks for joining us and have a great day. Take care.